Yeah, I think that you, um, you really see uh, the origins of the, of the idea of sovereignty uh, in the 1600s, where you have the situation where the old systems of the feudal order were breaking down. So you have this kind of social kind of tumult, a lot of conflict, instability. And the question is, how can we found a political community on a new basis? So the divine right of kings is no longer working. You have different interest groups. How do we unify this community? And the answer was the popular will. So the whole kind of logic for the society, the logic for political power, logic for the ultimate authority, the person who has the command, where do they get their power from? They don't get it from Adam. They don't get it from God. They get it from the will of the people, the consent of the people. And that starts out in a relatively tentative way with Hobbes and Baudin, and then becomes more forthright with people like Rousseau and Locke. And they explicitly say, Rousseau says, sovereignty is nothing less than the exercise of the general will. So any power in society has to be derived ultimately from the will of the people. And that's the basis of political authority that was arrived at in the modern era. So I think if you look at, at that as a model, I think COVID and the way that government occurred during COVID appears as a dramatic rupture or reversal of this basic um, principle. Because I think you really have the founding of state authority, not on popular will in any respect, but on natural imperatives, so on case numbers, on our numbers. Um, and so politics, politics was justified on the basis of cases are going up, therefore we need this new measure. Our number's going up, we need the new measure. Oh, our number's gone down, we can remove the measure. But politics for a period was pinned to statistics. Um, and they became a sort of political omen reading. So, uh, I mean, the health secretary said at one point they were looking at statistics on an hourly basis. You know, I'm not sure what could be revealed within the hour, but it was an omen reading. that This, this was the, the thing he gazed at in order to um, come up with a policy and not the representation of a will. So I think there's a way in which the population appeared as a disease statistic or an R number, and politicians related to the population through the R number, and that was the kind of goal of what they were doing. You know, Boris Johnson said, we must get the R number down. That's, the kind of, that's our aim. And you, people, are intermediaries for the R number. So you're the way I restrict you in order to affect the R number, but you and yourselves are not my direct concern. Um, so I think the population really disappeared as a willful body and became replaced by this kind of statistical um, element. I think what's significant, though, is leaders weren't representing their own will either. They weren't saying, this is about me, I'm imposing my authority, I'm a, you know, a big boss, a big guy. They were saying, oh, I don't want to do this. You know, this isn't, this isn't, I have no choice. You know? I, I, um, I would rather not have a vaccine passport, I'd rather not lock down, but we have no choice because the cases are rising and we must do this. So there's a kind of way in which um, it became a question of imperative and not of choice, even of their own choice. And so I think that the thing that happened in lots of places, so France, for example, they, create, they created all these benchmarks and they said, well, when cases get to this number, then masks will be required on ski lifts and vaccine passports on ski lifts. And then they kind of stand back and they wait and cases go up and they say, hi, you know, masks required on ski lifts. So it looks as if COVID itself has brought through the new measure, not the politician. Um, so obviously you had a massive growth of executive power. To all intents and purposes, parliaments were disbanded. You had ruling by decree on the continent and by statutory instrument on the UK. In the UK. And there was very much an idea that the more executive power we have, the safer we will be. So in Australia, they said, um, the state authorities were looking to have executive power for the health, essentially the health um, representative. They said, if we don't do this, cases are going to rise. The more executive power you have, the safer you'll be, the better the decisions will be made. There was also a fetishism um, of executive power. But the executive was not um, a representative of anything except for a sort of science, pseudo-scientific body. So it, the new... Um, Council, I suppose, for the king was the scientific, the Conseil scientifique in France and SAGE in the UK. Um, so the COVID executive is not um, an incredible power, but not in the way that you had very strong executive power in the past. It was as a naturalised body, as a body claiming to represent natural will, which is very different from absolutist kings who had incredible power. 
which they derive from the will of God or their uh, alleged um, descendants from Adam, um, very different from fascism, which had incredible executive power, uh, which they justified on the basis of the leader representing the national will, you know, being an incarnation of the nation. So I think that really what you saw was political authority became something naturalised. So outside of human society, but also outside of human will in general. So not, not as willed by anybody, not as wanted by anybody, but as, um, as imperative. And the, the vaccine passport was really the new social contract, which I think you saw probably most clearly in France, where they actually called it a social contract. And they said, this is the new basis of, of the founding of the nation in a way. So um, responsibilities could become before rights. So if you want to assume a place in society, you have to be vaccinated. Um, and Macron even said that the unvaccinated are not citizens. He said they're irresponsible and the irresponsible are not citizens. Um, I think it's very significant that the vaccine passport became the social contract because it's not an oath. You know, with fascism, to join society, you had to take an oath or join a party. You had to join a movement. It was an action or a, or a pledge of allegiance, a pledge of belief. The vaccine um, passport was basically a bodily act. It was a medical act. So I think it's very fitting that when society becomes justified on a naturalised basis, the basis of you joining it, your social contract, is a medical act. It's a medical procedure. So it's the medical procedure that ties you to other people and to the state in a society where social authority is justified on a kind of naturalised basis. I think you can see that COVID um, became very much the foundation stone of state authority in terms of the responses to the protests that occurred particularly in France and Canada. Um, so in France, you had the Convoi de la Liberté. So people started out from all over France and drove to Paris to um, protest. And, uh, you know, in many cases, there were kind of pensioners and camper vans and that kind of thing. They got to Paris and Paris was surrounded with a military ring. The, st the streets of Paris were occupied by tanks. Now, I think that at no point was there any attempt to negotiate or dialogue with the protesters. And they were all like middle-aged, very um, personable ladies, generally, um, the leaders. And, but there was no dialogue. Basically, there was, it was a wall. They met an absolute wall. Um, and that's very different to other protests. You know, most of the protests, the government sends their delegation, they discuss, they negotiate, they meet halfway. With this, it was like, no, tanks. You know. Same in Canada. You know, at no point did they send a delegation to the truckers. At no point did they negotiate. Um, they were, they were, protests were cast as being outside the nation. You know, um, Prudeau said, should we tolerate these people? And the use of the Emergencies Act was something that was uh, an act that was foreseen to protect the inter ter territorial integrity of Canada or to protect it from espionage. So the point is it's, it, they used an act which was used for foreign invaders that threatened the very integrity of the state of Canada. And that was how it was seen. People saying, we don't think there should be a vaccine passport, were cast as something completely outside the nation and as threatening the ter territorial integrity of the, of, the, um, of the nation. So I think that really um, what you see here is, is that the expression of will, which was what occurred in these protests, was not the basis of sovereignty, as it was in the past, but was a treason. You know, expression of a will, of saying, we want this, we want that, is a treason when it comes to covid um, which is why you get these extreme um, reactions and punishment out of proportion to the offence. You know, so I think if you look at all, almost all the COVID measures, have a complete disproportion in terms of the punishment and the offence, the harm done. Um, so you had seven years in prison, I think, for lying about going, coming back from Portugal, £10,000 fine for uh, table ser for um, serving from the bar. So I think that you had this extreme exaggeration of response because um, COVID had become the new cornerstone of society, the new justification of state authority. And in this context, any expression of will, of opinion, of a census, of interest was a treason and was a threaten threatening, threatening to that, that kind of basis. Um, you know, so the medieval treason law was very much you know, you can't debate if the king's the king. It's not like, hey, let's discuss. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. You know, it's not an issue for debate. 
um, because the king, being the king, is the cornerstone of the state and society, and it's the thing that integrates, the principle that integrates all the elements and is the basis of order. And so I think that COVID for that period formed the role of that cornerstone. And just like you cannot say, let's discuss if the king is the king, you cannot discuss, let's discuss if we should, we should, if we should have vaccine passports. It was the new treason, basically. Um, so I think that um, the other interesting thing is the role of, of the threat. Um, and I think the threat, in a way, becomes the actor in political life. So the, the, the reasons why you do things, the, the basis on which a society is organised... The driver cannot come from that society itself. It cannot come from the things we want, the things we will. It comes from outside. And your action is a response to the threat. So it's almost as if the system cannot justify its actions on the basis of its own logic anymore. Um, so you require COVID, um, the threat of war, terrorism, climate change. And there's a relatively conscious attempt, whenever you have a threat appearing of almost every um, political camp trying to repose this as um, the threat is going to cause the thing they want to occur. So I remember after, even after 9-11, there was a sort of saying, well, this is going to make us more, um, more understanding, it's going, to bring nation, it's going to bring America together, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. The idea that this event, this threat, was going to transform everything. And since then, you've had this series of uh, outside shocks and the idea that really you can only have um, change or you can only form um, uh, a political constituency on the basis of response to an outside shock. I think it's really a sign of a system that cannot derive its legitimacy from within itself but does it through outside events and it's always looking for those outside events so rather than looking to the people or looking to what is it we want, how is it we want to live, how is it we want to, Im um, to, to, to improve our lives it's a sort of looking at the skies all the time. So looking at the case numbers, natural events, climate change, and in a way you, just, you, der you derive your politics or your social system from what's occurring through, through this outside kind of force. So it's almost like, um, you know, like uh, uh, gas, if you subject it to extreme pressure, it will be liquefied, but it's almost like society cannot be held together except under this extreme pressure of an outside event. And so there's a constant looking, looking for threats um, to perform that role. And the role of the state becomes one of protection. So I remember watching some of Macron's speeches announcing lockdowns. And it was always, we're going to protect people from health, we're going to protect the economy, we're going to protect, we're going to protect, we're going to protect. Everything was being protected. You know, normally say, you're going to develop the economy. You know, we're going to um, improve people's lives. But no, it was, we're going to protect and I think that that um, is a way in which political authority becomes a question of maintaining things in a static state, a state of survival, of getting by, of being alive. You know, everyone's furloughed, so yeah, we can, we can eat, we can live, we can remain alive, but we don't live. So I think that there's a kind of, there's a kind of question of um, protect, protect, which is basically about maintaining things in a static state. Um, and not about the true question of politics is always a question of freedom and choice. You know, in Greece, when they developed the idea of politics, it was the realm of freedom and choice, and the realm of necessity was the realm of the home. You know, that's where you had to raise your cattle and you know, wash your dishes, and that was where the drudgery was. But the realm of politics was the realm of freedom and choice. Um, and I think now the realm of politics is the realm of drudgery and maintenance and keeping us alive. What, what the... Um, uh, Italian philosopher Gamben calls um, bare life, a kind of maintenance of, of stasis. Um, just a final point. So I think that, yeah, the current, the current um, state is increasingly defined on this concept of nature. Um, however, it's not, an, it's not a real nature. It, it's not really that COVID statistics necessar necessarily mean that you have to do anything. I think that it's a constructed idea of nature which um, performs a very particular role. Because um, there have been other political regimes that, define, that have been justified on the basis of nature. So uh, 
so Egypt and Mesopotamia, the king was basically representative of natural forces. So he would be there, he would be the representative of the Nile or the sun, and he would be responsible for um, flooding and having the crops grow and having all the fertility of the animals. And So he, he was very much responsible for the creativity of nature. But that was a very much responsible for, for creative principle. You know, he was, whenever they have these um, big ceremonies and celebrating of the king, it was always about, you know, there's lots of milk and lots of greenery and abundance. It's like, he's this great creator, this great creative force who represents the force of nature and the force of human labor in that society of work and productivity. So it's that the king who was representing nature, but he was representing the creative, active part of nature. I think that now they're representing a nature that is not the creative, active part of nature or the creative, active part of human society working on nature, but it is rather the opposite of our wills. It's, it's a nature that is, is merely exists as a dead, a deadening force, which is you can't go out, um, you can't work, um, you close down, you cancel, you restrict, you show your passport. And so I think that the logic of nature is not a real nature, but it's, it's just the inverse of popular so- sovereignty. It's a way of refounding the system on the opposite basis to the one it was founded on and should be founded on. Um, and, and nature is merely a reflection of the restriction of our wills and, um, and the thing that is ordering us to do things. But it's a, it's a mirage that's created out of that process of overturning a popular will and not anything that exists in its own self.